Welcome to Fire Engineering Radio and to our show, Pride and Ownership, The Love for the Job. I'm your host, Chief Rick Lasky. Uh, you know, I just want to touch real quick before we move on today with today's uh, guest uh, on our show and, and our topic um, and, and just kind of remark on this whole virtual FDIC thing they did uh, uh, in, in June was pr- pretty pretty freaking incredible, man. A um, lot of great feedback, uh, a lot of folks uh, tuning in and, and watching and uh, a lot of good emails from it. Um, I think that's hopefully going to be a thing of the future. We get to do these shows once in a while. You know, nowadays, especially right now with what's going on with budgets and, and fuel costs and, and everything else, and those of you out there that do budgets know what I'm talking about, how tough it could be. You can't make it to every conference. You can't make it to every seminar. And, you know, a lot of these firefighters out there are paying out of their pockets. Um, if, if you pay attention, if you're a realist, a lot of these people out there, you, you, you do see that they 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 take the money right out of their pocket to go to to these seminars and and better themselves and further their education and their their experiences and and uh, networking abilities and and for for FDIC um, and for for fire engineering to do what they're doing you know I keep going on and on about the website and you know I, I don't care if you don't have a dime in your training budget if you just go to fireengineering.com or you know or or just look at the things they're doing. There's plenty of free stuff out there, man. There's plenty of, of, of methods and means and ways to get the stuff to your people. And this was just another cool, cool thing to get involved in. It was just another, uh, again, cutting-edge thing that, that Bobby Halton and, and Peter and all of them are doing at, at, at uh, Fire Engineering to, to get the training and get the word out to um, the fire service, the fire service as a whole, to get it out to all these different folks um, uh, just so they have the ability. I, I don't care. Like I said, you could be a ten-person volunteer department in, you know, East Mud Flap, Texas. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's all there for if you if you want to look for it. Um, today, I'm I'm excited. I've I've got my best friend in the whole wide world on the show with us, uh, Battalion Chief John Salka from the New York City Fire Department. John's the battalion commander in the 18th Battalion in the Bronx. Um, you know, he's a, he's a volunteer. He's been doing that longer than he's been doing it paid, um, uh, probably 30 years paid service or better. Um, John's all over the world, and not just this country, all over the world lecturing on a variety of topics. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of those things today, but um, I, I'm just excited. Uh, I've been trying to get John on the show, and is as busy as he is, it's hard to nail him down once in a while. But, uh, John, welcome, buddy. Thanks, Rick. Great to be here. Uh, I'm just, you know, and, and, you know, you and I, and, and I tell everybody when we, and one of the lead-ins, John, that I do when when and you've been there when I do it when when you and I teach together or whether we can't make it is is how you know and I want to touch back on some different things and and the impacts that you've had on the fire service throughout your career. But you know, I tell people that when Get Out Alive and Saving Our Own started when we started that years ago. I mean, um, we, we thought we were going to have an impact on on the lives of the firefighters out there, and, and, and we did, but it, I know it was frustrating for you as it was I to see that, um, uh, you know, the numbers, you, you would expect the numbers to go down a little bit, and they weren't, and we've talked about that, and then we went, you know, managing the mayday and thinking that was going to help, and then back to the basics, and then I tell people all the time, John, what it's like when you and I go travel somewhere, and we get around the troops, and we hear all some, some of the silly things that are going out there, and and some of the things that we get our underwear and not over uh, leadership wise and, and that you and i tell people all the time that we realize that we're, we're losing a lot of firefighters before we ever leave the firehouse before that firefighter you know became disoriented and ran out of air somebody wasn't training that firefighter or they weren't they weren't uh taking care of business back at a firehouse um i mean it, john just reflect on it a little bit what do you think's going on what do we have to do leadership wise to start taking care of our firefighters better well <clears throat> I mean, a couple of things that you just said I want to comment first. Uh, number one, that everybody everybody out there is very hungry for information and for training and for whether it's training on Get Out Alive or Saving Our Own or, or, or leadership that we're doing now. Uh, and, and like you said, we talked about that years ago when we first started those programs, thinking, gee, we'll do it for a year or two and, and then it'll slow down because it'll be saturated. But, but it's never saturated. There's always new people coming into the fire service. There's always a, a fresh new recruit class graduating somewhere or new new young members uh, in, in a volunteer firehouse that are, that are looking for the training. They're, they're looking for the education and looking finding out how to do things and how to talk to people. And um, and that's just the way it is. So so it's never really going to end. I mean, like you said, we were sort of we sort of thought these these 
popular programs that we had would sort of go for a couple of years and then and then wear out. But they're not, and I think the same thing's going to happen with leadership. <clears throat> but leadership is a little different because leadership is something that just everybody, almost across the board, is lacking in some degree. I think there's a great there's a great void out there in the fire service. Not tremendous. It's not you know uh, the end of the world type of void. But I certainly think there's lots of places that are in need of some of a of a good new set of leadership skills in their department or their companies. And, and we hear that, as you just said, everywhere we go. You go to a leadership program somewhere and guys are coming up at the and telling you, you know, my captain did this, my lieutenant did this, or, or a lieutenant saying these, these firemen did this. I mean, it's not just one way. Uh, but certainly a lot of people need need to be uh, pointed in the right direction when it comes to leadership and, and how effective your organization can be. I, Rick, I think you remember when we were at FDIC one year, John Norman was in the room next to us teaching, you know, something about tactics, and, and Alan Brunacini was in the room next to us in the other direction teaching about something else, and then we were telling the people in our room, you know what, don't go to those classes until you come to our class. Learn leadership first, because once you do leadership, guess what, your tactics it gets better, you, 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 all the aspects of your fire department, everything that you do is going to work better when you have good leadership skills. Oh, and, and you know, and and that's not definitely not to knock uh, two legends in the fire service. And I and one of the things I got I got to talk about is, and, and I'm, I don't want to embarrass you at all, but I, I love the fact when we talk about um, uh, you know going back in time, you know, it just you know, and I'm here's random man again, just zooming out there. But I could just I'm sitting here all the time thinking about picturing what it would have been like to be riding in the back of Rescue Three with you, John Norman, and Jay Jonas as my firefighters if I was a lieutenant. <laughs> was who, was you, who was your lieutenant back then? Actually, Pete Lund, God rest and his soul. Tell, yep. You know what? Talk, talk, Pete as a leader. We're, talk, we're talking leadership challenges in a fire service here. Talk about Pete for a second. What, what you know? What stood out about him? I'll tell you. Pete Lund was he was he was, if not the best boss I ever worked for, certainly one of the best bosses I ever worked for, and absolutely the best boss I ever worked for as a young firefighter. And I, and I was a young guy when I got to Rescue Three. But uh, I remember working with Pete, and Jay and I would work in the same groups, and we'd be working a lot of shifts with Pete. And we would we would almost be on the inside. And, and, and in our language, that's like the good place to be. Inside is the guy with the can and the guy with the iron. So you'd be with the lieutenant, you know, crawling around in the rooms or, or going on whatever assignment we had. And, and I remember coming into work nights where I wouldn't know who the lieutenant was going to be. And as I pull up to the Rescue 3 firehouse up there on 181st Street, <clears throat> I would see Pete Lund's uh, wooden bear, white, Bali chief's car sitting out in front of the firehouse. And man, it would just, it would make my day. I would say I would know that Pete was working, and and that that's all I needed for the rest of the night. So it was it was going to be a great tour. We were going to have a great drill. We were going to we were going to turn out quick and go to fires. When we went to a fire, he was going to jump right in and get the chief to uh, to give us a great assignment. So it, it was always always positive. Well, and, and you know, and, and that's the thing. I, I had uh, uh, you know Tom Freeman, Chief Tom Freeman from Lyle Woodridge. We were on uh, talking company officer stuff a while back, John and. And we were, we, I was talking about some of my mentors and some of my idols at the fire service. And, and certainly you mentioned two of them already. Alan Brunacini has always been, I know, a mentor, you know, mentor to you and, and to me. And, you know, John Norman, um, I embarrassed myself with John one of the first times I met him. Um, and I went up to have his, his book signed, you know, he had, he had signed uh, his book for me. And, and I said, ah, it's a great book. He goes, did you read it? And I said, yeah. And he, he opened it to sign and he goes, the binder on his book hasn't even broken yet. You, you read this? I said, yeah. I walked away. I felt so bad. The next day, I came up there and said, "I'm sorry. I really didn't read it yet, but I just didn't know what to say." And, and he, we joke about that. That was <laughs> twenty something. I mean, we, we still joke about, about about that. But you know, that, when you tell these stories to, to the students, and I watch them kind of sit on the edge of their chairs, I, I, I find it interesting, John, because you know, there's plenty of role models out there. There's plenty of people to go out there and, and say, you know what, I want to be like that guy when I grow up in the fire service. I want to be, I mean, the, one of the first FDICs I was walking around with John Norman, he introduced me to Leo Stapleton. He says, when I grow up, he goes, I want to be just like that guy. I mean, and Leo Stapleton, the retired commissioner from Boston, right, and a legend. But, you know, there's so many people that when we talk about leadership traits, John, and, and you and I in our class talk about great leaders. We talk about, you know, Eisenhower and Patton and, and Bradley and, and every, hell, Vince Lombardi and different folks. Um, you know, a, a couple of people that, that, that pop into mind, and, I, and, I, and the reason I'm asking you is because you're intimately involved with some of these folks and got to you got to grow up in the fire service around them. But, talk, you know, another person I want you to comment on is talk about Tommy Brennan. Talk about Chief Brennan for a second. And, you know, the, the, what, the impact you think he had on the fires. I know that's hard to describe. That's, God, that's a hard question. I'm sorry, buddy. But it, it is a hard question because we don't, we don't have enough time to talk about, you know, the full impact 
that, that Tom Brennan had on the fire service. And, 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 you know, I never actually worked with Tom Brennan. Tom Brennan, Tom was out in Brooklyn and I was up in the Bronx and, and, and his, his path and my path, uh, probably, we, our careers probably just barely overlapped the end of his and the beginning of mine. <clears throat> but I got to know Tom after that to FDIC and I'll tell you what, uh, his, his ability to, to, to make difficult, you know, not, not, not not technically difficult, but just difficult stuff that we deal with in the fire service. His ability to make that understandable and, and for to make a crowd of guys sitting around a table at a pub or sitting in the back of a classroom on a break or in a classroom when he was standing up in the front teaching, uh, he had, he just had that great skill that enabled enabled him to pass the information on that he had that he learned over the twenty or thirty years that he spent in the fire service. And gosh, he was you know certainly he's he's missed a forcible entry but but he's lots of other things too and he could just make a group of a group of five or six guys who had two or three or four or five years in a fire service he could just make them light up he would just light them up with information and whether it was reading his his magazine article or going to sit down in one of his classes or if he was doing a keynote or certainly when he was out there on the road he was he was always the most interesting character on stage i'll tell you he he had a way of delivering stuff that 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 many of us myself included uh, have not yet been able to master well and you know and you and i again i've told you how uh, umpteen times how he has helped he helped my career he's still helping my i know he's he's passed on he's he's in a much better place and than a lot of us and then and, and just doing wonderful things where he's at now but he, he he he's done things for me and is still doing it for me um got me out of trouble kept me kept me straight and you know i was so happy john that i was able to before he he passed on to be able to tell him what he meant to me and you know he played it off i you know i, I believe in telling people it, really what, what those that impacted your life i just sent uh, diane feldman a nice email telling her i'm indebted to her for what she's done for me and my family, I, I can never pay her back um, for what she's done for me and my career, and, and for 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 Jamie and the kids and all of us. Um, I love her to death, but I, I had that opportunity to tell Tom that, and you know, he just typical Tom just played it off. Eh, yep. You know, yep. You, right? I mean, just absolutely. Very humble. Now, you, you know that book, the, the book that Engineering put together uh, after he passed away. You know, random the, thoughts. The, the, the accumulation of all of his uh, all of his back page articles uh, was a great book, and I started reading through it, and of course. Of course, a lot of what Tom wrote about, if not if not all of it, but certainly a lot of it, was was FDNY stuff, which is my job. It's my home, and that's where I live. And and, and so much of it meant so much to me. Uh, but it meant so much to me that I went and I bought three more copies, and I and I brought them into and I brought them into work, and I, and I and I signed each one not with my name, but with a little with a little note. Keep this in the house watch and read it every every tour, and and you'll learn something new from Tom Brennan. And I put one in the house watch of Engine Four Eight and Engine Eight Eight and uh, Engine Four Five, and and that, and those books are are just about worn out already. Worn out from guys sitting at the house watching, reading it. I'll get two or three questions on a 24-hour shift at the firehouse from guys, you know, with three years on a job that are reading it, and they'll come up and ask me a question. Hey, Chief, you know, what does he mean by this, or what does he mean by that? You know, a, some term that he's using or something that we may be used to do in the job that we don't do anymore, but they are just, they're just eating it up, and, and, and they're wearing it out because it's such valuable, you know, great information. Oh, and, and if you're out there, you know, to the listeners that are out there, if you're out there, and you can't find one of those in your firehouse. Besides going and and just you know going to Fire Engineering's website and looking up the articles, go go get a copy and get like like John did, like Chief Salka did. Get one for each one of your firehouses. We did it here. Uh, we put one of the posters up, um, and that's the, those are those. And I commented in the Pride and Ownership book how how John those are the little things, those random thoughts he did, just those little things. Those are the little things that save firefighters' lives, that keep them out of trouble or get them out of a jam or make a difference in their life and and man mm-hmm. all right i'm going to tug at your heartstrings here too cuz you and i will we'll, I thought we'll you be just on. did I thought you just did <laughs> well i know i mean and I, the more we you know if we both end up talking about time any longer we'll both be balling uh in here but um and i just i'm going to do it and and i don't get mad at me but you know, cuz he's a great guy but tell me about billy mcginn Oh, Tell me man. about Billy McGinn. I mean, Billy I, uh, McGinn yeah. was uh, well, you know, yeah, you know. For those of you listening, we lost Billy on 9/11. Billy was a lieutenant in Squad 18, and he was uh, <clears throat> he was a great friend of mine and and, a, and a, a colleague and you know and a mentor. And even though he was a little bit younger than me, a little bit less time on the job, I certainly learned a lot from him. And 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 the, and the story started actually when I, when I met Billy McGinn. I didn't like him at all. Uh, I was in 11 truck, and I had a couple of years on the job, and I think I was. Uh, King, whatever I was back then, I, I thought I was pretty full of it with about four four and a half years on the job, you know. And, and Billy McGinn walked into the firehouse, and of course, Billy McGinn had a college degree. He was an engineer and very, very bright guy. And uh, 
right off the bat he came in and, and, and very sharp too. He was very good with the tools and, and with, with, with everything. Uh, and I recognized that right away. And uh, he'd, he'd walk in the kitchen in the morning at 7.30 or 8 o'clock and throw, throw the, you know, a, a thing of donuts on the table and say, how's it going? And I'd say, it'd be going great as soon as you check the rig, Proby. You know, so I was always on top of him uh, doing this and doing that. And uh, But actually we ended up, after after a couple of uh, discussions and a couple of good fires that we had together, we ended up being very good friends. And uh, I left the Levin truck and went on to uh, Rescue 3, and he, he left the Levin truck and went on to a squad. He ended up being a fireman in squad one with me when I was a lieutenant. And then when I got promoted to captain, I went up to the Bronx, up to 48 engine. He got promoted to lieutenant, and I invited him up there, and he was one of my lieutenants in, in, in engine uh, 48. And then I left 48 when I got promoted to chief and went to the 18th Battalion. And he eventually left. Uh, 48 engine because they opened up all the squads. Ray Downey opened up all those squads uh, back then, and Billy McGinn had squad experience, so he he decided to try for a spot in squad 18. So we ended up uh, in squad 18, which actually all of our companies we we were in the same companies. We were in 11, we were in squad one, we were in 48 engine together. Or, and although we weren't together for the next stop, it was still the same number. It was 18. I was in the 18 battalion, and he was squad 18. Well, and and um. You know, one of the things I know that he just, you introducing to him, to me as was one of your instructors, and I just know how tight you guys got that, you know, and I tell my guys, you know, John, we talk about uh, 9-11 that, you know, Billy's Billy's still teaching safety and survival to my guys, just like Andy Fredericks is still teaching our guys uh, how to lead out about nozzles and hose, and, and uh, Dana Hannon still throwing ladders with them, and Ray and Pete and Dennis Cross and all of them are still mentoring me and other folks, and uh uh, what, what, a, what a great guy. You know, you know, something happened a few years ago that, that I know impacted how you think a little bit, um, especially rebounding as your department did um, from 9-11 with the unbelievable, horrific loss, uh, not just in you know wonderful people but the talent and experience. But you, you tell, I, I'd like you to tell folks, first of all, who's Jason Fry? When, and when did you meet him, and, and what impact did he have on you, what he talked about? Because we talk about him all the time. Yeah, J- Jason's a great guy. Jason's, uh, I guess he's he's probably long retired now from, from the Marine Corps. But he retired as a major, actually, after, uh, yeah. He's, okay. He's, he's, he's I, I met him out in California and uh, at a show somewhere. Actually, I can't remember. He was at, he was at a couple of shows. He sort of he sort of hit the stage and appeared at a couple of different shows, and, and, he, and he was talking about... Um, you know, talking about being being into the job and being into what you do and knowing about what you do and and how you treat your people and how you train your people and you know and he, and he told a great story about being over in Iraq and uh, how he ended up you know being in a Humvee with a young 18 year old Marine who was driving him who he had actually never met before until about an hour earlier and before you know what they're they're in a gully on the side of the road he's severely wounded and this young Marine is with him firing his rifle telling him I'll stay with you Cap don't worry I'm I'm, I'm here with you I'm not going to leave and uh, he reassured him several times that, that he wasn't going to go anywhere. And at one point, he thought he might even have to carry or drag him out of there because the enemy was, uh, you know, approaching. Uh, and, and he was so impressed at the fact that this kid that he had met an hour earlier, who was only 18 years old, probably flipping hamburgers at McDonald's nine months earlier, was telling him that, that he would die with him before he, w- he would leave him. And, of course, then he explained very, you know, emotionally how that that's how we train Marines, and that's what they're taught in boot camp. They're taught the value of of the brotherhood and, and what we mean to each other and, and that we wouldn't leave each other. And, and he said that, that you folks, meaning us and meaning everybody that's listening, yeah, we, we are just like the Marines in many, many ways. And, 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 and those couple of ways in particular uh, are the strongest parallels that we have. We, we, we are a very strong brotherhood, and, and we live and work with each other and sometimes, unfortunately, you know, get hurt and die with each other. But that's what makes the, uh, the fire service strong, and, and, and it's the responsibility of, of the leaders. The young lieutenants and captains and, and battalion chiefs or district chiefs, whatever the rank structure you may have, it's our job to pass that that spirit along to the uh, to the new firefighters whenever they enter our firehouse. Certainly not just the officers, because in my job, firefighters do a lot of that work too. But uh, it's the job of all of us in the fire service to break the new people in and, and bring them up to speed on on what it's all about and what their responsibility is to us and, and what ours is to them. And John, besides, you know, we know that those of us that know Jason, you're you're right. He's an incredible, incredible person. What a great speaker. You know, he lost his, his right arm in Operation Iraqi Freedom um, and just had, a, had an incredible leadership story to tell, uh, team building. I don't care what you want to call it, but when he taught, he described training to you on how, how they trained in the Marine Corps, and you paralleled it to what we do and what we need to do in the fire service. Um, 
you know, about how, you know, the, the, talk, talk for a minute about the whole realistic hard training thing that he talked about, about how, how they train Marines and how, and, and then how you think we should train our firefighters. Well, I mean, I think we've, <clears throat> in addition to he, he, we have been saying this, and, and Tom Brennan has been saying this, and Vinnie Dunn has been saying this, and all sorts of people around the fire service have been, you know, certainly the leaders and the teachers and the people that are out there, you know, writing the articles for the magazines and stuff have been saying for years, and, we, and we're not all doing it, that we need to make training, you know, realistic and effective and, 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 and practical. And, and, you know, I am not in any shape, way, shape, or form uh, knocking any type of training on, on you know, um, weapons of mass destruction and, and terrorism and all the things that we have to do to protect ourselves. And of course, that, that, that is, those are important new things that we need to all know about. But, but it seems when something new comes up in the fire service, everybody has to do, you know, 10 of those classes for 10 years. It, it's just like everybody grasps onto the newest thing, and sometimes they just let some of the important, solid things that we still need to do and pay attention to that we do every day, sometimes they let those things slide away a little bit. So I, I, I reiterate that a lot of my classes, that you should, be, you should be training on the stuff that you do most, that you spend most of your time doing, that you spend most of your runs going out on, and, and then, uh, like some of our other friends out there say, and then some of the other stuff you should be training on is the, is the, is the stuff that's high hazard and low frequency stuff, the stuff that you don't do too much, but when you do do it, it's going to be a pretty unsafe or pretty dangerous situation. We need to train on those things as well, along with the new tactics and the new terrorism concepts and all that. That's, that's all important stuff that's got to be looked at, but I hate, I hate people to forget the basics, and I hate the term back to basics because it's been used and used and abused and overused, but but it, but it's true. You know, some of those basic concepts that every firehouse and every firefighter need to know, whether you're in a two-station or a two-rig volunteer firehouse and, you know, a single station, or whether you're in a 30-station municipal department somewhere else, there's just some basic skills that we all we all have to know, and we all have to have down pretty good. Well, and our, our buddy, uh, buddy and idol, Leo Stapleton, said it. I remember back in the first year that FDIC, or fire engineering had FDIC, I was um, getting a... Uh, a little deal um, uh, given to me for the Saving Our Own program, and he got up before, and that's the year with the Back to the Basics theme, John. And if you remember, he, he stood up there and he said, I noticed that this year's theme is Back to the Basics. He says, uh, Back to the Basics. He goes, well, why did we leave them in the first place? We're not that good. And that's exactly what you just said is, is, is you know, we're, we're not as good as we think we are at search and some of the other things that we're doing. I mean, you see it, and Tommy Trevino, our buddy and one of our fellow instructors, it just infuriates him because he says, I get firefighters of 20 years that come through our, our, our safety and survival class at FDIC, and they don't know how to search. They don't know the basic concepts of search. Wow. They, they, they don't know how to search. And, and I'm going to throw that at you. Right now, uh, let's put Chief John Salk on the spot here. Biggest, biggest challenge facing firefighters and keeping them alive. And you've talked about this in a couple different areas. What, what does John Salka think our biggest challenge is right now to, on the fire ground? Let's deal just with the fire ground stuff, mm -hmm. with, with, with training. What would you train a firefighter in to, to give him the best or her the best chance of survival on the fire ground? Well, I, I think there's two skills or two sets of skills that are, that are, that are lacking out there. Um, one of them is um, orientation. Mm -hmm. Fire ground orientation. That's one of my specialties, so of course that's one of the things that I think is important. And, and let me just say, John, real quick, that class that you do is the, always, always the most popular. Young, old, it doesn't matter. That is one of the most challenging. It's one of the most fun, but it's one of the most... I, I watch guys go through that class, John, with you, and they come out and they're so mad at themselves, they, they want to go back through it like right now. You know, right. That is an right. incredible program. Absolutely. And, and room orientation is a very unique program. It's not really taught in lots of places. We sort of put a we sort of put a, a spin on it, and not a spin, I because that's a you know not a political word, but but it does have a little bit of a spin on it that it, it's new information. It's just it's just stuff that guys have not really thought about before. So it's a couple of unique concepts that really help you uh, know where you are, and that's what room orientation is all about. And and if you look at the NFPA statistics or anybody else's at the end of the year, firefighter fatalities and injuries. Lots of firefighters die from lots of physical different reasons, heart attacks and and crushing injuries and thermal burns. But a lot of those guys get lost first. So, mm -hmm. so firefighters being lost is a tremendous um, negative impact on firefighter survival and safety. Yet, a lot of firefighters are not paying attention to knowing where they are. They're paying attention to search. And as you just said a few minutes ago, search is vitally important. And there's some specific tactics and skills you have to have. But you also have to be doing at the same moment, 
at the same moment. They're two parallel skills. You've got to be paying attention to where you are and keeping yourself oriented. So, so that's one. And I, and I could talk all day about orientation, but, you know, me and my crew, and we, we do a lot of that, uh, a lot of that room orientation all over the country, and it's very popular. So that's the one skill that I think uh, firefighters on the fire ground need to put some more time into. And the other is, believe it or not, and this couldn't get much more basic than this, is SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatus, usage and familiarity and, and, and operations, you know, emergency skills being part of that. The, the two emergency skills that just about everybody should be familiar with in practice, uh, just donning and doffing an SCBA, just how to use it when you have a minor problem, such as a cracked face piece or reduced air, um, when you run out of air, what to do, how to filter breathe, how to get that thing around off your back onto your side if you've got to get through a breached wall or, you know, another narrow a area. Um, SCBA usage, you could probably teach, everybody could probably go to a week-long class, you know, every quarter, and, and still learn something new. So I would say orientation and SCBA use. Well, and, and you know what, and, and I know you and I, we're, we, we talk about this stuff all the time when we're together. Um, when, when I was involved, when I was in Illinois, I teach for the uh, Illinois Fire Service Institute at U of I, the 40-hour smoke divers class that he did, John, was incredible. I mean, you talk about, you, by the time you were done, there was, at the end of the week, the end of 40 hours, you knew everything about your air pack. And, you know, Greg Fisher, Dave Newcomb, and Bill Farnham, and Cheryl Horvath and the group, um, Jeff Welch, you, I talk about the SCBA harassment drill, they used to call it, where they would have the students, you know, 30, 50, whatever it is in the, in the group, and they'd get you to a point where they'd start off where they'd, they'd split you in half. And, you know, we always talk about whenever you take your air pack off, you need to take it off and lay it and set it in the ready position. That means straps, everything, it's ready to be put back on right now because you don't know when you're going to have to put it out. You know, if you're out rehabbing or whatever you're doing, you need to have it in the ready position. And when you get in that habit, your air pack's always ready. And, and if it's the next guy in the next day, for whatever, you know, some places, a volley, volley department, you know, where you don't have time. You run, you get jumped a rig, you don't have time to make sure everything's in order. You're hoping the last guy took care of business like he should. And, John, what they would do, is they would take the students, split them in half, and line them up behind each other, two lines. And they tell the first group, turn around with your backs to the other students. And, and each student had another student. You would have to walk up to their air pack, which is laying behind them, and do a minimum of three things to it. Not break it, but disconnect, reconnect, do things, tangle, whatever, tie. And then they would say go, and you had to turn around, and they would time you on how long it would take to put your air pack and, and don it properly, no air blowing out, no nothing, no problems. And, it, it, you know, they call it the harassment drill. And you, yeah, at first you think, oh, they're screwing with me. By the end of the week, if you're always used to putting your pack in a ready position, there was nothing, John, you could do to these students that they turn around and go, oh, that's it? That's all you can do to me? You could do ten things at air pack. They would boom, 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 get it all hooked up, get it all back right, don it without any air leak, without any air blowing, and, and do it fast. Yep. That was incredible. Now, the room orientation drill that you and I have talked about, I used to love, we used to do, and, and you talk about simple stuff, John, is the, it, it, we used to, in the, in, in the burn buildings, we would put, you know, we would set the room up where we'd have a, a bowling pen, we'd have a hydrant wrench, we'd have a hose dummy, we'd have a cinder block, uh, whatever, a short, and send two firefighters in, their partners in there on air, and they would have to crawl and go in one end and come out the other end. As soon as they came out, they would have to take their pack off really quick, get to the dry race board, redraw the room, where the sofa was, where the window was, where the door was, where the, the center block. And people would ask you, what was the point of finding that gated Y up there? And the whole idea is just what you said, John, was to put, put the room together in your mind. When you're in there, in order to stay oriented, you've got to imagine what the room would look like without smoke. You've got to realize, uh, how many guys, John, do you know that crawl right past the window trying to find a way out that never reach up. You know, I mean, how many times do you see that in your classes? Right. Oh, absolutely. And the, and the reason is they lack those skills. And, and we did the same thing when I was a state instructor in New York State here. We used to teach the uh, uh, a mass confidence course, and, and part of it was you'd go into a room, and, of course, the instructors would set the room up uh, with a garbage can cover and a roll of toilet paper and, and a football and stuff that had absolutely nothing to do with anything, mm -hmm. except that you had to realize when you were searching through this thing, thinking you were staying oriented, thinking when you were looking for a victim, if you found something, you had to quickly put your mind on that item, identify what it was, and, and realize where it was, and then when you came back out, you had to draw that map, and you had to draw where each of those items was, and, and people asked the same question. What does a football have to do with have to do with this? And I said nothing. I was just trying to, to to allow you to develop 
two separate trains of thought going at once. One is your searching train of thought while you're trying to, to do your job, and your other train of thought that should be parallel and continuous and running at the same time is your orientation. So you're tracking everything and finding things and identifying them and knowing that you passed a football in a garbage can cover on the way in. You know what? If you pass a garbage can cover in a football, you're on your way out if you, if you, if you remember those things. So that, that's a, a great concept. Exactly, and, and and here's the other thing too, John. A lot of guys forget is that when you're teaching these firefighters, these officers to identify and, and recognize where they're at, the, the room, the hallway, the stairs, the windows, the doors, you know, traveling from carpeting to tile back to carpeting, what that means, um, all this different stuff. And we're just dealing with residential structures. So we can get into commercial buildings. How easy it is to get lost in there and not stay oriented, but it also when you force them to stop for just a split second, recognize what they have in their hands or where they found it, I think it really helps them. It, it helps them slow down their breathing. It help, You know, when you're concentrating on something, you don't have time to get all wigged out and twisted off on, it, you know, I think it helps them with air management. It calms them down. Right. You know it. When you're lost in a building and when you, I, I tell guys all the time, John, if you've never been turned around or lost in a building and disoriented, even for a few seconds where your sector C all puckers up, then I just met your hydrant guy. You know what I'm saying? Every single one of us has talked to furniture, been twisted around, turned around, or gone, I thought this was the hallway of the door. And and probably if you generalize it, our biggest deficiency to fire service is our failure to, you know, if we talk about all the different contributing factors, you know, failure to read the building and to fire properly is, is that's it. Everything falls into it. And with that, if you're going to crawl into a building, you know, zero visibility with an air pack that you've never been in before, Hell, some of our guys can't even do that in their own house. You're going to have to work on those orientation skills to, to, to understand and recognize where you are at all the time. Mm-hmm. So when something goes bad and the world turns to shit in there, you better be able to turn around and find your way out. And if you're the captain or lieutenant, oh, my God, that's important. Sure. And like you said, you combine that, and, and orientation doesn't start inside. Orientation starts outside, like you said, with sizing up the building and looking at what you got. you got to... A, a, a 23 by 16 foot one story private dwelling with two windows on each side of the house we're looking at a little tiny little private dwelling well you know there's going to be little tiny rooms in there too I mean if you go to a big gigantic McMansion you better know there's going to be big gigantic rooms and when you're in a bedroom it might feel like a, a gymnasium or something so you know you combine those skills your outside you know interpretation along with your mapping of the room and your orientation skills inside and you're you're a long way towards coming out of that place someday you know well, exactly, and, and what I've always admired, and I've got videotapes to prove it, and I tell people, and, and there's a lot of fire departments, there's over 30,000 fire departments in this country, and a, and a ton of great ones, but I'll just refer, because I'm talking to you about New York City, I have yet to go there once, be riding out with you, or when I used to ride out with Sal and Donnie and John and everybody else, is is to look up, when, when, to see the guys get off the rig, and everybody looks forward and then looks up everybody stops for a second everybody's si- it's everybody's job the size of the building and do just like you said you know we we've we've lost the art of good size up you know where you know whether you look at you know is this building balloon frame is this just veneer is it ordinary is it all this where are the windows is that a bathroom is that a bedroom is that a stairwell you know i, I think we just we've got so many folks that are running into buildings you know, we miss walkout basements. We don't right. we don't tag we don't lap the building as the company officer first in to see if I've got four floors behind me when I only got two shown out the front. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to do that when I was a captain of forty eight engine. We'd be up there on the on the fire floor, not going to fire down, and then you know now we'd be milling around, washing down, you know, just talking. And and I would mention to one or two of the young firefighters, I would ask them, uh, "What floor are we on?" And most of the time, I got a pretty good answer because the guys were, were were good and they were well trained, and we were breaking them in well, but. Uh, you sometimes you'd just just get that deer in a headlight look. You know, a guy would look at you like, "What, what floor are we on?" Uh-huh. You know, and all of a sudden the guy would, you know, he'd realize he didn't know. He'd, and he'd say it. Gee, you know what? I don't, I don't know, Cap. I think we're on the third or the fourth floor. Well, and, and, and it's scary if, if if you're outside, John, and you're calling your engine crew, and you ask them, and they're in trouble. Where yet? I think knowing what floor you're on is pretty important if we're going to send people in for you, the fast truck or whatever, right? Absolutely. If you don't know where you are, front or rear, left or right, top or bottom, what floor, at least you can give us an idea where we can we can send the cavalry in if you're in trouble and we're going in a direction, you know? Well, and, and, and let me let me just kind of shift gears there we're, while we're talking about, again, we're talking about leadership challenges and how leadership affects everything we do, but and and it, we, there's a million different directions you can go with this, and we're talking about it. What we talk about, talk, talk to us for just a little bit. Tell, tell, our, tell, us, tell me, tell the listeners, and I learn from you all the time, John, you know that. Officer accountability. Let's talk about that lieutenant or captain because we know that's the person really setting the tempo for things. It's not, 
you know, schmucky in the in the white shirt, the chief. It's it's the it's the people that are running the show in the firehouse. Donnie Haight always said, "Don't blame the firefighters. It's not their fault. Blame the company officer. He, he or she's the one leading the band. That's the, you know, t- t- tell us a little bit about. You're a battalion chief. You're the you know the battalion commander for the 18th battalion. You got all these lieutenants and companies, uh, you know, and captains in your charge. What do you, what does Chief Salka expect from his lieutenants and captains in the 18th Battalion? What would I would tell me what I should tell my guys here? You know what? Uh, uh, once again, you're asking a question that we don't have enough time to cover. I expect <laughs> I expect, I expect so well, much. You know what? You know? But, but uh, how about this? Can, we, can I get you back? I mean, let's talk about that right now. Right. But uh, let's. I want to get you back on again. Oh and, sure, uh, and we can talk. We can do a whole thing about but, about company officer development. But I'll tell but, you what: the officers in my battalion, the lieutenants and the captains in, in my battalion, and and. And not just in my battalion. Those are the people that I'm, that I'm responsible for because they, you know, they belong to me. We belong to each other. We're part of the same uh, unit. But but I run in with other companies that administratively are not under my supervision. But but I run in with them on a regular basis. I see them on every other run or every third run. You know, so officers in general, but my officers in particular, um, they're they're re- they're really responsible. And I hate to say it, it sounds ridiculous. They're responsible for everything, and they really, in in my job and in my battalion in particular. They really handle everything. My company officers handle everything. And I'll tell you right up to when I teach, I teach my dis- my training class, my leadership training. I, we, you know, we touch on discipline and the and the importance of, of of doing it and taking care of it. And they even they even handle disciplines many times right in the company, right at the company level. Maybe the lieutenant reports it to the captain, and the captain handles something between the fireman and the lieutenant or whatever goes on. And I'll find out about it a week later. Uh, the, the captain will come in and say, "Hey, chief, just want to let you know we had a little." Uh, a little, a little something going on at the firehouse that I needed to, uh, you know, to handle. One of the firemen is uh, do, doing a couple extra Hail Marys for us, and uh, and that, that's why he's doing that, you know, whether he's working somewhere else for a week or two or whether he's staying late or coming in earlier, whatever the whatever, whatever the, uh, the discipline that the captain decides to, to hand out. But the point is even discipline they handle in the firehouse. But, but that's not, I don't want to talk too much about discipline, but they handle training. They handle motivation. They handle inspiration. They handle, you know, I mean, right in the firehouse, taking care of the, taking care of the rigs, getting dressed properly, wearing your SCBA, going over the tools, starting the saws in the morning. I mean, we could go on and on and on and on, and all of that stuff is under the purview of, of the company officer. Those are the folks that they're not out there getting it done every day. They're not standing on the apparatus floor next to the probie who's checking the rig. But you know that they're the one that, that's asked the probie to get it done, and you know that when, when the probie or the junior firefighter working that day gets done, that they're going to give the boss a nod and say, the rig's okay, Lou. And I, and I tell guys in my class, the rig's okay, Lou. That, that's just a couple of words, but that means that a 45-minute job has just been completed, including fueling up saws and starting every motor that, that, that has a spark plug and picking up every tool and wiping it or cleaning it and, you know, retaping company identification color stripes on, on tool handles. Every, every, every firefighter, not every firefighter, but a, a firefighter or two every morning, and every company does that. You, don't have, all, to, you don't have a list on the wall, John, that you, you have to hand out to people to say, you know, today, guys, if you don't mind, I'd really like you to go and look at the tools and see what you don't have to do. That they actually do this on their own with your company officers. Absolutely not. The company officer, company officers, if they didn't come into work, it would get done. And then the officer, the, the firefighter, just wouldn't would have to wait to, to get an officer to report that it was done to him. Every single morning, the, the saws are started at the same time. As a matter of fact, my job, a lot of guys work twenty fours, but most of them do it on on swap offs on mutuals. So you work in a day tour and a night tour, and we, and we still recognize and we still announce the change of tours, even though maybe everybody that's working the day is going to continue through work in the night. But do you know at the change of shifts, the rig is looked at and the, and the, and the store is started again, just just like it was at 9 o'clock in the morning, even if there's only one new guy coming in. Well, and, and again, I was being sarcastic because I've watched your guys work. I've watched, you know... People, person for position for position relief. It's not, hey, I've got you, John. Uh, I'll cover being a cam man for a little bit. Wait, no, until no. It's, I've watched your guys do face to face, position for position. Um, you know, I'll ask you this question too: Who gets the credit for the bad stuff going on? And who gets the credit for the good stuff going on? Well, that 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 that's got to be written in the Bible somewhere. That's old. That's old information, right? I mean, but but it's very very valid still. You know, when when good stuff happens. And I used, and I remember being a captain. I had great firefighters when I was a captain of 48 engine. When good stuff happens, when you're successful, when you make a great stop, when you when you do a CPR stave out on the street, whatever it is, you know, it's the guys, it's the firefighters that that did a great job. Those are the people that get recognized, and those are the people that the officer should be pointing to when somebody says, uh, "Lieutenant, uh, you know, I, I hear your company made a great uh, rescue today. Uh, uh, you know, what happened?" That's what you tell them. Go talk to those guys. They're, they're the ones that did all the great work today. You know, and of course. The 
the other the other side of that coin is is the lesser the less popular one, which is when something goes wrong, you know, it's your fault. It's the officer's fault. Don't ever blame a fireman or his lack of skills or, or time on the job or anything like that on, on a company's inability to, to maybe get a job done. You just have to you just have to eat it. You're the company officer, you have to eat any criticism and say, you know what, I take responsibility. If we didn't get something done it's our fault. We'll look into it and try and you know brush up on that or get that done better next time. You know, and I, and I do. I think it's sad, and you've seen it where sometimes you get some guys, and and they, I don't think they realize what they're doing. Sometimes that they blame their fire. You know, all these firefighters, they don't care. They don't do. You know, I, I've got a bunch of a couple of slots, and, and and it goes back to what are you doing as lieutenant or captain to to take care of those folks? And I don't care if you have a chief that doesn't support you or not. You can you can still take care of that business. You can still take care of that stuff. So I guess well we our administration. All right, recognize the fact that you may not have the the support from up above that you need, but but when are you going to do your job as a lieutenant or captain and and show responsibility, you know, and, mm-hmm. and take care of your people? I mean, you hey, know, Rick, I, that, rem- that reminds me of a story uh, uh, years ago. Uh, Bill Moore, uh, he's retired battalion chief now, but uh, he was he was a captain in my study group, one of the guys I studied with up here, along with Jay Jonas and a couple, you know, and a bunch of other great guys. Bill Moore was getting promoted to captain, I believe it was, and uh, and and us, all the other guys in the study group, we we all went out to the promotion. We generally did that. We all went went to, to each other's promotions to support each other and congratulate each other. And I remember going to his promotion, and there was a. Uh, it was an old, it wasn't actually the chief of the department, but it was an assistant chief at the time. He was acting chief of the department, and he got up there, and, and he was taught, and actually it was in a, in a pretty in a pretty difficult time in our job when things were going on. They were closing companies, and there was a lot of mistrust between the administration and the field and things like that. But uh, he got up there and said, look, congratulations to all you guys getting promoted to the different ranks. And, and he spoke to each rank, you know, lieutenants, that you're the new bosses now, and now the things you used to do, maybe the things you have to supervise. And then he said, and you captains, you, you have a company to run now. You have lieutenants to supervise as well as ca- as well as well firefighters, and you know, have your whole company to run. And, and they said the same thing to the chiefs. You have even a bigger a bigger area, but, but similar duties. And he said, what I want all of you to do is, he said, don't worry too much about what's going on at headquarters. Don't worry too much about what's going on in the job, meaning meaning the big job, the department. He said, there's things going on in this job that, that are just out of your control. They're out of your purview, whether we're closing companies, whether we're laying people off. He said, I've been around for a long time. I've been here through layoffs, through the fiscal crisis, through all sorts of negative situations, he said. And, and what got us through back then is what I'm going to give you the advice to do. And he told them, just pay attention to to what you're doing. Pay attention to your groups or your shift or your platoon. If you're a captain, keep your company running smoothly. Keep your firemen happy and well-equipped and trained. If you're a battalion chief, keep the things in your battalion running smoothly. Just pay attention to the stuff that, that you have your hand on, that you're in control of. Don't put too much time or, or don't have too much anxiety about the other things because you have no control over it. And and I was I was... I was livid at the time with that advice. I thought, God, what, what, what a what a cop out! He's trying to say ignore what's going on at headquarters, so they don't have to take any heat over it. But now, fifteen, twenty years later, I'm, I'm, I realize that that was very, very valid information, and I, and I suggest that everybody do that. I suggest whether you're a lieutenant in Toledo or a captain in San Francisco or wherever it is you are. You know what? Every department has some issues or some things going on that that guys might not be happy about, or the folks that work there might not be happy about. Just pay attention. If you're a lieutenant and you work with the shift, pay attention to your three or four or five guys and keep them trained and keep them safe. And if you're a captain or a chief, you know, obviously the, the group gets bigger and goes up. But if you, if you pay attention to that stuff, keep your little group and your little world operating safely and smoothly and clearly, then then your world's going to be good, you know, and there's somebody else to take care of the, the, the bigger things above you, you know. Well, and, and John, you know, it, it all comes back to this whole leadership thing we've been talking about. Um, you know, and, and again, not to not to put you on the spot and everything else, but I mean, you, you know, you, you put a, you put a book out first in, uh, last out, uh, leadership lessons from the New York Fire Department, and that has had an incredible impact on the fire service and the private sector. I've watched you do programs for for Lockheed Martin and Boeing and, and uh, Sandia National Labs and uh, all these different Morgan Stanley and MBNA and and now the NFL teams, you're doing the coaches and some of the teams. But the fire service, I mean, it, it's kind of funny how, and I tell people all the time, I, I laugh when I, I watch when folks come up to you, we're teaching together, we're at a show, and they say, oh, Chief Salk, I loved your book. I loved your management book. And you go, what, 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 what? I didn't write a book on management. I read a book. I wrote a book on on on, uh, on leadership. Um, I mean, it, it, everything you've been doing, um, and, when we, and it all comes back to this whole leadership issue. How? I mean, how how much emphasis do you place on the whole leadership aspect of what we're trying to do? 
you know, I, I don't think you can, I don't think you can measure it. I think uh, leadership is so, you know, entwined and and so much part of everything else that we do. Most of it is invisible. Most company officers are are, are superb leaders. They're, they're great leaders. Most chiefs, battalion chiefs, district chiefs, chief of department, whatever they are, most chiefs have some some good leadership skills already under their belt that they learn from mom and dad or maybe from their first lieutenant that they work for. So. Leadership is there, and I think a lot of times it's 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 invisible or transparent. Uh, when it's missing, suddenly when it's missing, it becomes more obvious. Then the leadership uh, right. issue some, sometimes is, is is more important for people to take care of. And everybody everybody can improve. Everybody has areas uh, leadership skills that they probably need a little brushing up on, or maybe some that, that are absent totally. But leadership is involved in everything we do, as you said, and as I've said, and all all the other folks out there talking about leadership. Uh, it's the it's the core element of everything we do. And, and if you've got good leadership skills, all of the other things, all the other tactics or skills or tasks, no matter what it is, those things are going to flow easily and develop more effectively. You're going to have a safer fire department and, and happier people coming into work, you know, which, which all results in positive, uh, positive everything. And is it, that, is it complicated? Is it voodoo? Is leadership, is being a good leader like something you got to go spend tens of thousands of dollars on to get your skills to where they need to be? Or is there a ton of, how much of an investment do you have to make in, in being a good leader? Is, is it that much, or is it, is, is, can anybody just, with the right mentoring and the right you know, resources and that, improve their skills and, and become one of those people that people turn to? Well, the only investment you have to make is my book. It's fourteen ninety five. Oh, that was shameless, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, let me uh, I'll tell Peter right now. I'm I'm scratching that off the list because I had let me see. We're, I had that on the list here to, to talk about, but um, but no. See, I mean, and we've talked. That was kind of a, a, a you know a question that didn't you know. It, it just it, 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 it's, it's, it's costs you nothing. Like like we like you and I talk at every leadership program we we, we present. We say you know what most of your leadership skills are the skills that you learn when you're riding in the back of a fire engine, listening to the captain and the lieutenant talking in the kitchen or seeing how they operated fire, seeing how they talk to the chief on the phone when he calls up with a with an issue or a problem. And uh, We learn most of our leadership skills during life. We, we, it's not like you've got to go to a class. Now, I'm not suggesting that leadership training is invaluable because it is, particularly yeah. in the fire service, some of the stuff that you're doing, and there are other guys out there as well doing doing some great leadership stuff. Uh, those classes are valuable too, but you know what? You don't have to take a mortgage to, to go to the FDIC and, and sit in on, on you or I or one of the other guys that are teaching, whether it's tactics or leadership. But, but speaking of leadership, yeah, there's some great new, and, and it's growing. There's great new classes out there, and, and it's growing. You've got all sorts of people out there coming up with good, effective programs on leadership, and, and they're all pretty unique, and they all talk about some different elements of it. And you and I, you know, and we talk about you get to a point where you can pick out these folks. You and I sit at our conferences when we're teaching. I tell people all the time we sit there at break time, and when guys are visiting, and you watch, we, we, you and I look around the room, and you'll lean over to me and go, "It's the captain. That's the lieutenant." You can tell because you could tell those that have their act together. You could tell those that are gelling. You know, they, I mean, they sit down as a crew. They sit. They're off duty, and they still kind of. Where, they, where, right. where are you sitting at, Cap? And they, I'll go get the coffee for you. No, yep. I got it this time. And you and I have talked about how you can pick out those that are are, are really leading and, and walking the talk, and you can also pick out those that are kind of hovered up in the corner by themselves, and their their crews kind of fragmented, splintered. You, you can see that stuff out there. No, it doesn't take, you know. Like you say, a, 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 a you know, a loan on your on your mortgage to your house to go out and get this stuff. There's plenty of people out there to, you know, what I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you about two more guys before we get done here, um, and and I mean about leader Mike Mike Smith. Mike Smith's a friend of ours. He's working with FEMA doing some things. Um, w- w- tell me about Mike. About I mean his personality, his 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 way, his strategy when it comes. Mike's to a great guy, and and again. Again, and, and, and it's another thing that, that we teach or we talk about when we talk about leadership, and, and I tell people all the time, everybody's leadership skills and tactics should be a little bit different because everybody's education level is different, everybody's experience level is different, everybody grew up in a different town with a different, different mom and dad, everybody had a different fourth grade teacher that taught them some early lessons in school, so, so everybody's leadership skills and tactics are a little bit different, and, and, and Mike Smith is a, is a glowing example of that. Mike, Mike you know... I heard some fantastic stories from him when he was a, a, a chief, a battalion chief, and deputy chief in, in D.C. fire department, and, the, and the, the challenges and the difficulties that he had, you know, with different people or different situations. Everybody's had those, and how we handle them. The, the thing about Mike is Mike's 
Mike's a little bit older than me. Mike was a, a, a soldier in Vietnam, and he's a pretty straight shooter, and, he, and he's a pretty tough guy too. And and he just he just calls him as he sees him. And if you're screwing up, Mike is right next to you telling you you're screwing up, which which is a pretty a pretty good way to run the show. You know, no, nobody can say, "Gee, I didn't realize you weren't happy with the way I was doing things," because he, he's right on top of you if you're not doing it right. However, he's a guy that's also his other hand is always out and offering you assistance. You know how to get how to get the job done. If you don't know how to do it, ask me. We'll do some training or, or whatever it may be. So, you know, you can be critical. You can be on top of people. You can be a straight shooter like Mike is. But you also have to have a you know you have to have the other side too, and you have to be able to pick people up when they fall down and, and train them if they're not if they're not ready to get a job done, and, and inspire them if they need a little bit of that as well. So, yeah, he's Mike's a uh, Mike's a great pretty unique example of, of how to get the job done. He, he's got that, when we talk about that big brother kind of style leadership, where he can, like you said, he can stand you on your head when you need it, but at the same time, he's going to help you, he's going to lead you, he's going to teach you, he's going to help you with those things. And then the last guy I want to ask you about, there's so many to talk about, but there, you know, there's this, this circle that we run with, and we're talking about leadership examples and demeanors and, and different styles of leadership. Like you said, everybody has something different. Um, and, and I know you're going to refer to this guy as a prince, but uh, just for a couple of minutes here, let, talk to, uh, explain to our listeners, uh, w- tell me about Butchie Cobb. Uh, Butch, Butch, <laughs> is a, Butch is a great guy. Butch is a, uh, gosh, I think he's got 35 or 36 or something years on, on the job now, he's deputy chief in, uh, in Jersey City. Actually, he just got done uh, being a chief of operations and chief of training for a couple of years since he made deputy chief. He's, he's worn a couple of different hats. He's been doing a great job over there. I've known Butch for a, a long time. I'm, I'm I'm looking at a picture of him right now in my bookcase. Uh, with, actually, book, uh, Butch and Mike Smith and myself, we were at a, at a conference somewhere out in California, and, and the three of us were there. And Butch is just a very, very soft-spoken, um, easy-going guy that that that's so knowledgeable and and so has such great experience from Jersey City and teaching and and, and other things that that uh, he's he's just a, 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 vi- a valuable resource of information you know when you go to you go to a seminar or something like that and you listen to one of his classes you, you sort of feel like you're in a room with him by yourself you know yeah, like yeah. there's nobody else there like he's just talking to you you know which is that's a wonderful skill to have and and and, and i don't have it but he does have it and like and, and 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 the value of that is some when you're sitting in a room and you really do lose everybody else in the room it's sort of like he's talking to you it's like a private lesson, and, and you, you know what? You just do better with private lessons than you, than you do with a hundred other people in the room. Everybody walks out of there thinking that they just had a, an hour and a half discussion with Butch Cobb, and he, and I don't know how he does that, but he's got that way of, of coming across to people. And then you combine that with his, you know, his technical, tactical, strategic, you know, knowledge and abilities and experiences, and he's just a uh, another one of a kind guy, another great guy to, to to travel around with and talk to and listen to. Well, and and I've heard people describe him from his job. John is one of those guys that, you know what, you could blow something up right next to him, and he'd look and go, okay, and he would, there's no excitement, there's no screaming, there's no, you know, none of that. And, in fact, when we get you back on a show later, we're going to talk about uh, one of the articles you wrote, one of the, you know, the topics you talked about, about not yelling on the radio and not getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> and and we'll talk about what that could do to your fire ground in a heartbeat. But, but yeah, I've heard him described as, you know, he's got that calm demeanor, smart, doesn't hesitate. He's not slow to have to switch with the city, very Brilliant, just just one of those guys that you know. Well, all right, you know, just things could kind of uh, that that Dennis Cross, you know, uh, battalion chief, you know, that we lost in nine eleven. Kind of, I watched him. What was that? Fifty seven battalion in Brooklyn. Battalion um, five seven, yeah. Yeah, and he just, I'd watch that guy fires. Uh, John just kind of, you know, the Eddie Enright. Hey, Rick, look, we got jumpers. All right, we got. It was just, it was just like. You know, hey, let's get let's get at it. Let's do it. And I mean, these guys handle an emergency scene, and they they handle a rapidly developing emergency, like 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 the guy behind the counter at a hardware store. Next, like next customer. That, that that's what the next incident is. That's what the next occurrence <laughs> is. It's just like the next thing. Okay, up oh, or oh, we'll have to handle that. All right, you know. And and you know what? What a great way to handle rapidly developing emergencies. You know, calmly looking at it. Figuring out what you have to get done next. Okay, well, let's do this. Let's do that. Let's reach, let's pull people out. Let's get some hose lines over there. I guess if that the fire's extending that way, you know, without the yelling and screaming and the excitement and all the other, uh, you know, all the stuff that goes with it. Well, right. hey, buddy, let me. As we, we're going to wrap things up here, and we are. We're, I'm, I'm promising everybody out there, we're going we're to definitely get you back on the show a bunch of times because this is we just we just 
I, I know you well enough. I mean, you're my best friend. We we just touched the tip of the iceberg when it comes right. to visiting with with Chief Salka, um, John. Uh, for the newest firefighter up to the most senior, what 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 advice would you give? Uh, to, let's deal. Let, you know what? Let's deal with that new firefighter. What would you tell? What would Chief Salka if you if you were one on one? If some kid came up to you and he or she said, Chief, what, all right, I want to be great at this job. I want to do things. What advice would you give me? With all your your thirty plus years experience, what would what would you tell me? What advice would you give to a new firefighter? I would tell him now that you're on the job, get into the job. You know, and and getting into the job is a whole different thing. There's some guys that are on the job and they're collecting a paycheck and they're getting on the rig and they're doing their job at every fire and they're coming back and sweeping the floor and doing everything else they're supposed to do, but they're really not into the job. And that that component, that element of of being into the job is what is very valuable in my fire department. I'm sure it's very valuable everywhere. Uh, that's the thing that we hear, you and I, sometimes that that some places that some people are missing. And if you get into the job, that means you're getting, and I'm not telling you you need to do these specific things, but that means you're getting a couple of magazines at home. You're, you're getting, uh, you know, periodicals where you can read and read articles from some of these great guys out there that are writing about some new stuff and about some old stuff. It means, it means you're going online to these great websites, like like you mentioned earlier. FCIZ has a, you know, and Fire Engineering have a great website out there with all sorts of stuff. I mean, you could, you could visit that a day, you know, an hour a day. And I'm not su- suggesting you need to be spending all your off-duty time talking or dealing with the fire service, but whether you're a career or volunteer, if you're new, you need to immerse yourself. You need to, to read, you need to study, you need to pay attention, you need to ask questions. You know, if you just do those things all the time, I don't see how you can't uh, do very, very well in this in this job, in this industry. Uh, we've had our friends talk about becoming a student of the job, man, and just, hey, um, you know, I know you've got, geez, probably over 50 programs that you do, and and, and a lot of people I know want to want to be able to reach out to you, and they do. Um, as we close things up here, John, if, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, I know you um, would you would you give them um, your your website so they know how to reach you there. And how about your website and an email address if they wanted to get a hold of you and ask your advice or heck, talk to you about coming out and doing a program form or whatever. What, what's the website and then what's your email address? Yeah, sure. The, my, my company's Fire Command Training, and that's that's what the website is: firecommandtraining dot com. And uh, and you can get me at uh, at firecom training at AOL. Uh, that's my email. That's one of my emails, but that's the one that uh, that most people get a hold of. So uh, be uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Oh, outstanding! Well, you reach out to Chief Salka if you if you're looking for any advice. Uh, if you need him to come out, if you got some stuff going on, he can definitely come out and help you straighten it out or, or get you back on track or get you to where you need to be. And it does, it's not just leadership; he does everything. Uh, if he reaches, you know, you get him to reach into that bag of tricks he has. It's like uh, I've seen people turn around and, a- and ask you, John. Okay, now that we've done this, um, you know, our instructor didn't show up uh, this afternoon. Um, can you? Yeah, I'll do this. You know, well, he was. I'll do that too. And and so if you're looking for, I mean, what a great resource. And uh, John, I, I can't thank you enough for your friendship and what you've done for me. And and uh, uh, buddy, you are you are my best buddy in the whole wide world. And, and I mean that with all my heart. Uh, you got a great family. You're you're a great. Uh, father and, and, and husband and, and brother and, and firefighter and officer and leader, and, and we're just lucky to have you doing what you're doing, and I can't think enough. We are going to get you back here, buddy. We're going to get you back great. on our look, bunch look of Look forward to it. Thanks for having me out here, Rick. It was a, John, it was a thank pleasure. You. Thank you so much, brother, for, for, for coming on the show. Uh, we've been visiting with Battalion Chief uh, John Salka from the 18th Battalion in New York City Fire Department, and um, gr- unbelievable, uh, great leader in the fire service, among other places. Um, uh, please uh, spread the word uh, about what, what's going on. You know, one last thing before we close up here. Please keep... Uh, uh, those in the Midwest, those in Iowa, with all the flooding and, and everything bad going on out there, um, please, please, you know, keep them in your your thoughts and your prayers. And uh, they, they've got a hell of a time going on out there. Um, uh, just you know, challenges every day, and just you know, how do you how do you deal with some of that stuff when you're dealing with nature? Um, so please keep keep them in your thoughts and prayers. And uh, maybe if you know somebody out there, send them something. Uh, if, if anything, just send them a little email. Tell them you're thinking about them. If you can't do anything else. Uh, but with that, uh, another great show, and I appreciate everybody. And, you know, again, if you're looking to get a hold of me, you can contact me at rick at prideandownership.com. And uh, any thoughts, ideas, uh, keep the emails coming. We've been getting some great uh, responses to the shows and some of the other programs. And as always, we always end the show by saying uh, these, these two words, and that's uh, be safe. Mm-hmm.